So the title of my sermon this morning is Forgiveness, Repentance, and Bitterness. And we started off here in 1 Kings chapter 8. Kind of a long chapter. We see this is the dedication of the temple, the, the temple that Solomon built. Right before that, they had the, the ark and, the, and the, um, the tabernacle. David wanted to, to you know, David said to, to God, you know, hey, you know, I live in a house. Why is it that you only have a tent for, for your place? I want to build you a house. And that, you know, it came into David's heart and God allowed him to do that, except he said, well, it's not going to be you that builds it. It's going to be your son because David had shed too much blood over the, the course of his, his reign as king. And uh, so Solomon gets the opportunity to, to build the temple. And this is where we're at in chapter 8. They've completed the whole temple. They brought everything in. They brought in the ark. And, and Solomon kind of preaches here and he, and he makes this, this prayer unto God and dedicates the, the temple. And the part we're going to focus in on here is going to be in verse number 33. But before we even get to that, we're going to start with a, the topic of just forgiveness. I've been thinking about this for quite a while. I heard a sermon preached by another pastor uh, a while ago, and it really got me thinking just in general on this topic. Now, I've studied out forgiveness in the past, and one of the things, you know, first of all, just what is forgiveness, right? I mean, we forgive somebody. I think everyone here probably knows what forgiveness is. It's when, you, when, you, when someone does you wrong and, and you show mercy to that person, you forgive them for, for what they've done. It doesn't make up for what they've done. It doesn't change any of the facts, but you're not going to be holding a grudge against that person because of what they've done unto you. You're able to forgive them and move on and move forward without having to exact any justice for what was done wrong to you. Or even after, you know, we're, we're basically you're able to move forward and, and put everything in the past behind you. That's basically what forgiveness is. Now, we're going we're gonna, to, in order to have a good understanding of forgiveness and how we ought to forgive, we're going to look at how God forgives people. Now, it's a good place to start. Now, I just want to point this out. We are not God, obviously. And there are some things that God does that isn't necessarily right for us. So we're going to look to see, first of all, I want to start with looking at how God forgives. Because if there's a commandment that says, well, this is what God does, but this is what you need to do. Obviously, we need to listen to what God says. This is how you do things. But I don't think that there's any contradiction here with the, what, with the way that God deals with things and the way that we are commanded to forgive people also. I think it follows up exactly the same. So we're going to start by looking at just in general the way that God works, the way that God forgives people, because we're going to be applying that to us. And then we'll also look at some commandments, especially in the New Testament, regarding specifically when we're supposed to forgive. Because I'll tell you what, we are supposed to forgive people. Right. But we're going to go into detail on some of the circumstances and instances on when to forgive people. Unfortunately, I think there's, you know, there always seems to be these pendulum shifts of how people hold doctrine. And there's a tendency to kind of get out of line. And these days, I think with forgiveness, it's it, it, Christianity as a whole or in general in the United States puts forth this notion that basically you forgive everybody all the time for everything, no matter what. And that seems to be this prevailing theme of forgiveness, but that is not biblical. I'll give you a good example. And this is the example that I heard this other preacher use. And it was an older sermon, not, not too old, it was some, you know, relatively recently. If you remember the shooting that happened in the church on the East Coast. Was that, was that in South Carolina? The, in in the, the church, they're holding the Bible study, right? And the guy came in. It was like a black church, generally. And, and the white guy came in, and he, and he shot up a bunch of people there and killed some people there, right? And horrible event, tragedy, right? Obviously, uh, uh, not, not a good thing. We're not condoning any murder or anything like that. So this guy came in, and he murdered a bunch of people. But one of the things that happened as a result is that some of the members of the church just said right off, the, this is almost like right away, just like, well, we forgive this guy. Now, there's a problem with that because that is not scriptural, depending on this guy's attitude and actions and stuff. When he goes in there and he kills people and he's not sorry for it and he's like, no, I wanted to kill these people and I did it and I wish I would have gotten more. 
That person is not, is not biblically to be forgiven. I mean, that is not something that follows through with the way that, that God forgives people. That does not follow through with, with what we're taught on forgiveness. And we're going to get into Scripture on this because you might be thinking, like, what? You know, that's, I've never heard that before. But, it, you know, it, you got you to gotta check with the Bible and with Scripture. First of all, all forgiveness, almost, almost all forgiveness that God does is conditional. And I've noticed there's two different types of forgiveness. And I actually preach an entire sermon on two different types of forgiveness that God does. There's a forgiveness that is literally based on your works and your actions and the things that you do. There's also a forgiveness that is by grace. Now, the forgiveness by grace is what we receive when we get saved. Amen. That has nothing to do with our works. That has nothing to do with our actions. But it is conditional. Not everybody in this world receives forgiveness for all of their sins that they've done. It's not like everybody, everyone who's ever lived, we know they're sinners, but they don't just automatically receive forgiveness from God. There is a condition put forward on that. If thou believest with all thine heart, right? If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, yes, your sins are forgiven. That is Now, it's not works. It is God's mercy. It is God's grace. It is wonderful that God has extended that to us. However, there is a condition put on receiving the forgiveness of your sins. There is something that needs to happen before God will just forgive. It's not this automatic thing that happens of just instant forgiveness right away. And this is something that I think was misapplied. You know, even though God is extremely forgiving, you know, praise God for his mercy endureth forever, right? I mean, praise the Lord for the extent of the mercy and the long suffering and the forgiveness that he offers to us. But it is not unconditional. And of course, you know, like I mentioned, the, the salvation by grace it has nothing to do with our works. That is one type of forgiveness. But the other type of forgiveness, as in our previous memory verse, we remember as in Jonah chapter 3, right? And at the end of Jonah 3, and in the whole book of Jonah, the story is about Nineveh. It's about Jonah going in to preach to Nineveh because Nineveh was living in wickedness. The people of Nineveh were, were living wickedly, completely forsaking the Lord and doing all kinds of, of just wicked things. And God was going to destroy the city as a result. As a judgment, God was going to come in and say, I'm wiping you out. The, the message that Jonah preached, yet 40 days, right? And the Lord shall overthrow the city, He's going to overthrow Nineveh. But what happened was the people got right with God. They called a fast. They, they turned from their wicked way, which means they stopped doing the wickedness that they were doing. The Bible says, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had thought to do unto them. So the, 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 the evil that God was going to do, the, the destroying of the city, God changed his mind. He repented when they repented of their wickedness, when they repented of their evil deeds, and the Bible calls that works. So there is a works associated with being forgiven of things. Because when God spared his judgment, what did he do? He forgave them, right? He spared that judgment. They, did they deserve the judgment? Yeah, they did for all the things that they had done. But when God saw that they changed their ways and started doing right, he said, you know what? I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring that judgment anymore because they started doing what's right. And that's the works-based type of forgiveness. And that's, that's not something that you can achieve for your eternal soul. And I'm not going to get too much into that because it's a little bit outside the scope of um, what we're dealing with today. Now, these concepts are very important, though, to keep in mind when studying forgiveness. These forgiveness of God, based, uh, the difference between the grace and the works. Because people get confused about this and start thinking our eternal salvation is based on works. Because of the verses that teach a forgiveness based on works. So like people think our, your, your, your soul is saved based on works because of certain passages that might tend you to think, oh, well, if I receive forgiveness based on doing good, then that's how I get saved and go to heaven. But it's a, it's a complete misunderstanding and misapplication of what those verses are saying. Like, for example, in the case of Nineveh, that was relating to an entire city. That wasn't any one individual soul being saved and going to heaven. That was just the judgment of God coming upon a nation, which that and oftentimes that's where you're going to find because that is how God deals with nations. They're not they don't have a soul. 
They have a whole bunch of souls individually. But a nation doesn't have a soul that needs to be saved and go to heaven. So God deals with them according to their works as, as a group, as a unit. But the individual is based on, on, your, soul, on, your, on your heart and, and whether or not you put your faith in Christ. Now, it's also true that saved people still need to seek forgiveness. Not forgiveness of the punishment of hell. We don't need to be forgiven of the debt that we owe, the hell debt, right? Once you're already saved, that debt is cleared, it's paid for, it's taken care of. So I don't seek, you know, some people think you need to, to ask for forgiveness every single day in order to be saved. You have to go to God, confess your sins, and ask for, ask for forgiveness. That's not true. Once you're saved, you've received the, the payment that you owe for all of your sin, for all time. That's cleared, it's done, it's paid for. But there are still many verses that teach us that we need to be confessing and forsaking our sins and seeking the temporal forgiveness that God's going to bring. Because what we, the Bible teaches that we reap what we sow. Right? right? Whatsoever a man uh, soweth, that shall he also reap. If you reap to the wind, if you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind, right? So as Christians, as believers, that applies to us. Absolutely. We need to watch out on the things that we do. That's why we try to stay in line as closely as possible to God's word and God's laws and his commandments and do what's right. Because even though we're saved from hell, that doesn't save us from the chastening of the Lord, from his disciplining and from, from his, you know, the, the beatings, I like to call them right in our life, spiritually, the, the things that we do, hey, we need to be corrected. Okay? But God also can provide mercy even in that also. And the, the best way to understand this, and I love this analogy, I bring it up all the time, is when you're born again, you're saved, you're a child of God, God's your father. I can't tell you how many times with my own children I've extended mercy unto them. They've done wrong. I mean, they're, still my, they're my children no matter what. Just like we're, we're children of God no matter what. Once you're born into his family, you're saved. You're his child forever. But we do wrong just as my children do wrong. And sometimes, especially depending on their attitude and how repentant their heart is over what they've done, I will extend mercy upon my children. They may not get a discipline at all, if they really understand what they've done or the, the discipline might not be as severe as it would be. I mean, think about it. If, if I told my children not to do anything, they just completely disobeyed, disregarded, and they like didn't even care that, that what they did was wrong, they're going to face a severe correction, a severe punishment for, 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 for completely disregarding and disrespecting what dad said. However, if they are just, they did it and they're like, I'm sorry, I know what's wrong, I shouldn't have done it, I don't know what I was thinking, Dad, you know, like, like I'm not going to do this anymore. That's what I'm looking to achieve anyways, right? So, so the forgiveness is going to come a lot quicker and, and more abundantly over that type of an attitude. And this is what the Bible teaches over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture is, is, that type of event, that type of heart, that type of an attitude being there in order to receive forgiveness. Now, we ought to be able to forgive when it's earned, but also when it's unmerited, right? Because forgiveness isn't, isn't something that's merited usually. It's something that, that needs to come um, as a result of the person that you've done wrong to. Now, the vast majority of cases of forgiveness in the Bible come from someone acknowledging their sin and seeking forgiveness. And when I, I did a word study just on forgive, forgiveness, forgiving, you know, all the variations of the word forgive in the Bible. And honestly, the, the, like this con that, that concept is the number one thing. There are one or two exceptions, and we're going to get to that near the end of the sermon, that, that um, don't necessarily fall in line with this teaching. But we're going we're to take a look at that and see what the, how we apply that. But one of the main things where you see forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament is with the animal sacrifices, right? It's an atonement for sin. You, do, you, know, you bring in the sin offering, and they do all these burnt sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now, we understand from Romans 4 and many other places that people have always been saved by grace through faith. People have always been saved. They didn't need, you know, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to save. It's not going to save your soul. 
There needs to be a better sacrifice, which was made. And people understand the Old Testament, but they still need to carry out these, these, um, these sacrifices. And it wasn't just... Um, It wasn't just for learning, like a learning exercise about, about a greater truth, although that was definitely evident in, in, in all that was established for those offerings. I believe it was also for them to get right with God. When you do wrong, when you do wrong, when you sin against God, we all need to be getting right with God. And the way they, they did that in the Old Testament was they would bring a sacrifice unto the Lord, and that was their way of getting right with him. Right? If, they're, if they had this rebellious attitude in their heart, they're not going to be bringing a sacrifice and, and saying, oh man, I screwed up. I gotta, you know, now I gotta, it's going to cost me because they've got to bring in their, their, their bull, their goat, or whatever the, the case may be, whatever the requirement is. That's a, that's a cost for them to, to go and do that. And in order to bring that, you're going to be, you know, have, a, have the right attitude of, I want to get right with God. And that's what he's looking for when they carried that action out. That was the forgiveness that they would receive. What we see here, let's look down in this chapter where we started in 1 Kings chapter 8, is, is Solomon asking, you know, going to God here. Look at verse number 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. So he's saying, he, he's not asking God. Basically, as there's these prayers, if they pray towards this house, towards this temple that we build for you, God, you know, hear our prayer. And God's judgment will come upon the nation when they forget God. And so what he's saying is, okay, God, when the enemy comes in and they're defeating us and everything's going wrong and we're being judged and we're being chastised because we've completely forsaken you. He says, when they turn again to you, when they come back, when they confess thy name, when they pray, hear their prayer, God, and forgive them. That is the condition that, he's, that, that Solomon is giving to God. saying, hey, when they get right with you, when they're turning back to you, God, please forgive them. Let's keep reading here. Verse 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man, or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hand toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men, that they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Who's saying, you know their hearts, God. When they turn to you, no matter what the case is, whatever the affliction is, whatever the problem is, when they turn to you, when they pray in his name, God, you know their heart. Right. When they turn their heart to you, forgive them. This is the request that Solomon made. And this is the standard that we see set forth over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible. This is what we see as the precursor to receiving forgiveness. Look at verse number 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and I'll be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives on the land of the enemy far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name, then 
Hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee in all their transgressions, wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. This was God, I mean, Solomon's prayer and his request to God and all the things that are spelled out here. You could see the repetitiveness of if they get right with you, if their heart turns from you, if they repent from their sins, if they turn from their evil way, if they get back right with you, God, hear and forgive. Be merciful unto them, Lord. Nowhere is he asking him to extend mercy, to show forgiveness when they're completely stiff-necked and going against God and, and worshiping other gods and everything else. You're not going to find that anywhere. Right. Now, God answers Solomon's prayer. He does in 1 Kings chapter 9, but go if you would to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It's worded a little bit differently here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. There's a, there's a little bit more um, information here that I wanted to, to, to cover because... This is, you could say, well, that's just Solomon's request unto God. That's just what Solomon wants. Well, yeah, but it's scripture, first of all. And second of all, God actually answers his prayer. God hears everything he says and he gives him an answer. So let's see what God, what God thinks about this, about, about Solomon's plan for how the people are forgiven and everything else. Let's see how God answers him. Look at verse, uh, chapter 7 of 2 Chronicles, verse number 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So now there's God saying, that's exactly what I'm going to do. If I see that they turn from their wicked ways, I see that they've humbled themselves, then I'm going to hear, and then I will forgive them. This is the, the forgiveness that God extends to people. It is conditional. And I believe that's something that we ought to have in our lives too, that it should be conditional. There are things that people need to, to, to do and ought to do in order to receive forgiveness. Now, look, we're going to get to, we're, there is an exception for this. It's not in every single case and every single thing that anyone has ever done any wrong to you at all that you can't extend uh, a forgiveness to them. However, before we even get into that, I believe that we are required to forgive of people who have the repentant heart and to come to you with the humility and, the, and, the, you know, and this type of thing. That that is something that if you are not forgiving of them, then you are in sin. Right. Amen. That we need to be forgiving as God is forgiving toward us. Right. Now, can we expect God to forgive us when we do not have a repentant heart? Of course not. When we don't even acknowledge our sin. There's no way. I mean, you can't even get saved without acknowledging your sin. Amen. You have to realize that you've done wrong. You've broken God's commandment and there is a judgment associated with what you, what you did was not right. You were wrong. And you have to humble yourself enough to say that I'm not right. That I have done wrong and I need someone to save me. I mean, that's how you receive your, your, the, the mercy and the grace and, and the, the forgiveness from God is by, you have to be able to acknowledge. If you can't acknowledge that, then, then you can't get saved. You can't receive your forgiveness. And that is the most merciful and the most forgiving is being forgiven of all of your sins. Like you, you don't get any greater forgiveness than that. And that, like I said earlier, is that's conditional. So I don't believe that we're required to forgive everyone of everything all the time, no matter what. I don't think that that is a proper teaching. I think that's false. I think that the Bible completely destroys that way of thinking. Now, we're also not supposed to be like these revengers, right? So about, don't take this to the other extreme and say, oh, okay, well, if that's the case, then I'm just going to make sure that they get everything coming to them. And, you know, no, no, no. That's not the way it works. It's just, this is, I'm just dealing with a matter of, of, of when it's okay. When, like, think about this. If someone came in to my house 
and killed my children because they hate me. They hate what I stand for. They hate the way I preach. They come in, they murder my children, and they laugh about it. Am I just supposed to be forgiving of those people? I mean, would you be forgiving of that person? Would you just say, oh, well, I forgive you anyways? Of course not. No way. And, that's, and we see in the Bible, you know, the people, the, the evildoers and the wicked of this world that can't even rest at night unless they're devising some kind of mischief, as we've read throughout the book of Proverbs, these people that are extremely wicked, it's righteous to ask for God's judgment upon those people and to not spare and to, and to even rejoice when the blood of the wicked is shed. That that is something that the Bible teaches also. So it's not this unconditional forgiveness. It's not just this, well, as a knee-jerk reaction, you do something wrong to me, boom, you're forgiven. No. And it's actually teaching a bad message. To be like that, it, it, that's not the way that we ought to be because that is not the way that God operates and that's not the way that we are commanded to operate either. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And the point of, of thinking that, like, we've got to be careful that we don't think that we are somehow better than God, right? Like, if God has all these conditions on forgiveness, but you say, well, I'm going to be even more forgiving, right? I'm just going to forgive anybody no matter what. You be careful with that because you don't want to be, you know, trying to place yourself as just some, some more righteous or more holy person than God is. Because God doesn't do that. And we look to see that the things that God does to, to, to help us understand what we should be doing. Psalm 32, starting in verse number 1, the Bible reads, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And this is, this is the psalm that's quoted in Romans chapter 4. Verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of the great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. So we see here, you know, David's, you know, singing this psalm and saying that, that he's had God's hand upon him heavily. And what is the result of that then? He says, you know what? I, I confessed my sin unto God. I didn't hide it from him. I, I went to him. I was repentant. And then he received forgiveness. And I'm only bringing up a couple examples. You can do this study for yourself. You're going to find that what I'm, what I'm showing you here is, is completely as true as the day is long. That this is what's required. Look, we're going to go to the New Testament now. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. In, uh, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 19, the Bible reads, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even in the New Testament, you know, we've only seen, looked at the Old Testament examples at this point. The New Testament, the same concept is being taught. If we confess our sins to God, then He'll forgive us our sins. Luke chapter 17, look at verse number 3. Sarah, sit up and sit still. Luke chapter 17, verse number 3. Take heed to yourselves, Jesus Christ speaking, and if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Amen. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And this is what I was talking about. It's commanded for us to forgive. He says, thou shalt forgive him. But look at the condition that they put in here. He says, take heed to yourselves. Right? If your brother, uh, someone who's another, another believer, someone else in the church, they trespass against you. They are in the wrong, and they do something wrong to you. He says, well, if that happens, rebuke them. Okay, first of all, rebuke them. Don't, don't hold it into yourself. If someone does you wrong, you have to let them know. 
Okay, when situations come up in church, we don't want to have these problems. In church. God wants a unified church. We are supposed to be the body of Christ here. The Bible talks about how we're different members individually. Every member of the body is important. If you consider yourself a member of this church, if you're here this morning, you are a member of the church. You have an important role. You have an important function. And as a body, we need to be able to get along with all of the other members of this church. And if we are not getting along together as a unit, then we're not going to function properly. We're not going to be doing as much as we could. There's a problem. It's like a, a sickness in, in your body when not everything is, is functioning together as it ought to. Which is why if someone does you wrong, personally does you wrong, you need to rebuke that person. And if you're not willing to rebuke that person, then I think you ought to forgive them. Because if you're not going to, you can't just let these things fester. When you have a problem with someone else and someone does you wrong, you can't just not do anything about it, but continue to have and hold a grudge against that person for what they've done to you. That's going to hurt the body. Right. That is bad for a church. That is going to lead to, to, to worse sins and, and, and more division within the church that God does not want to have happen. If someone does you wrong, rebuke them. Right. Just tell them you've done wrong. Get it out in the open. See, God has a way of dealing with disputes within the church. There is a format that is actually set up where God says, you know, this is the way you deal with it. If someone does you wrong, you confront them one-on-one. -on -one. You, you try to take care of that problem individually. If you rebuke them, they've done the wrong. And here it's saying, hey, if, if he repents, then it's your job, it's your duty to forgive him. They've done you wrong, but they're sorry about it. They, you know, they, they confess, they, they've humbled themselves. They're wrong. Forgive that person. Even if the same person transgresses against you personally seven times in a day. He says, but every single time is repentant. Forgive them. He says, thou shalt forgive them. You say, but I keep on doing me wrong. This isn't right. Why does it keep doing this to me? If they're repentant, you forgive them. And we need to be able to have that type of an attitude within the church because, look, we don't, the church is extremely important. Amen. And the way that, you know, the church, you guys know this here, but the church is not just a pastor. The church is not just a couple people. The church is the whole group. Everybody here is a part of a church and everybody here is important. Every single person. And there's going to be new believers and old believers and people all along the, the way and everyone in a different area of their life. Some people are going to be more sinful than others. It's just going to be the way it is because hopefully we continue to reach people and continue to bring people in and we need to disciple them. And usually what's going to be the case is someone who's younger in the faith, someone who's, who's, who, who doesn't know as much, someone who's just not grown as much is going to be more likely to be the one transgressing against you. They're just spiritually not as grown up. But we need to be ready and willing to forgive when they are repentant, when they are acknowledging their sin. Now turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. You'll notice that in Luke 17, where we just read, I mean, the condition is there that they're repentant, right? It's not just forgive them everything, no matter what they've done. Now, look at verse number 21 of Matthew 18. We're going to see a question here, and I think this is probably where some of the teaching might come from of just this unconditional type of forgiveness is using this verse out of context. Look at Matthew 18. Girls, stop it right now and sit still. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, in this passage, you're going to see that there is no mention of repentance or anything like that. But here's what I'm going to say. When we understand the Bible and you see a concept taught clearly just all throughout Scripture, and then you come to one verse where it's just like, well, I don't see it there, so that just must mean I just forgive all the time no matter what. That's kind of silly. It's a nonsensical way of understanding Scripture. 
But even in this context, though, we're going we're to jump up a little bit because we're going to get this in context. We're going to see that, that when you get this in context, it's still implying that there is some sort of repentance there. Now, what I love about this verse, though, is that it's just like in the previous uh, scripture reading that we had in Luke 17. It doesn't matter how many times someone does you wrong. We still ought to be ready to forgive. And that is indicative of the way that God forgives. God forgives us ultimately of all of our transgressions. And God will forgive us when we continue. I mean, think about that. We do, I do wrong probably every single day. I sin against God. I want him to be able to forgive me when I'm repentant and I'm sorry and I go to him. And, and I'm glad that he does. And I'm glad that we have a God that doesn't say, you know what? You've been sinning every single day and I've just had enough of it. Even though I've been repentant, you know, like, this is the way that we need to remember ourselves when someone else just seems to continually do you wrong. They don't respect me. They take me for granted. They don't appreciate the things I do. They're doing me wrong this way. They're doing me wrong that way. When they're repentant, we need to be able to forgive. Sit still. Go back. Sarah, go back by your mother right now. Let's jump up in Matthew 18. We read verses 21 and 22. Let's look in context here in verse number 15. Because the, the, the question that Peter asked Jesus Christ, you know, how often shall my brother sin against me and, and, for, and I should forgive him, came as a result of what Jesus had just said previously. So look at verse number 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Sounds very familiar to Luke 17, doesn't it? When your brother does you wrong, rebuke him. If he repents, great. If your brother trespasses against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. You don't have to make this a big deal. You don't have to have, let everybody know about this person did you wrong. You deal with it privately. Thou hast gained that brother. Look at verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Because what happens usually when someone does you wrong or there's a dispute, there's a, well, this happened, no, this happened, and you got these, these kind of countering stories, and, and sometimes you're not able to deal with it one-on-one, -on -one, and you kind of need a little help of mediation between the, you know, what's going on and what's being said. So he says, okay, if, it, if it's kind of a difficult situation to deal with, then bring a couple people along so they can hear everything that you're saying, everything that they're saying, and try to help out this situation and, and, and help you come to a common ground and, and really determine the accuracy of what happened. Because oftentimes people's recollection is different. It's, you know, one person says this thing, the other person says that thing. They're two different things. So when you get these people involved, it's to help in the process. Two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Verse 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them. And what does that mean? To hear them. That means you've involved a couple of people and they're all seeing things the way that you're seeing them, right? I mean, you, you've involved a couple people. You've both said your side of the story. And they're saying, yeah, you know what? You're wrong. But he refuses to hear them. Now it goes up another level. If you shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. So now it becomes a whole church-wide matter. Because look, these things are important, as I mentioned earlier, when there's a problem within the church, just between two people. We don't want to let that fester. We don't want to let that get just continue. It needs to be handled. Tell the church, it says, But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. That is when you start to, to shun people, right? Or, or, or to disassociate yourselves with them. Let them be as a heathen person unto you. Because they haven't listened to you. They haven't listened to these other people. They haven't listened to the entire church. Now, the church has the authority given by God to arbitrate in these situations. Right. And, and ought to. And, you know, and there's rebuking going on in, uh, in Corinthians about, about you, know, you, you take your brother to law, you know, one against the other, and that before the unbelievers. He's saying, you should be taking care of this in church. Isn't there anybody that can judge? Anybody who's... You know, who's able to, to judge between the smallest of matters? But here's the thing. When it, when, when it comes, to, when any of these things resolve the conflict, 
It is not right to deal with that person as a heathen man. When the situation has been resolved, especially with you personally, but, but what about if it's not even dealing with you? If this is just some issue that some other people had and now you don't like it because they did wrong to your friend, you're going to treat them as a heathen person after everything's already been resolved. That is wrong. That is wicked. You're in sin. Amen. That's right. When things get resolved, it's important for the unity of the church to be able to look past the transgressions and forgive. And be done with it. Now look, I understand, especially as a church, you know, our church is great. As the church gets bigger, you're not expected to be best friends with every single person in church. Just not going to happen. I mean, people with different personalities. Some people just, you know, they do things. And it's kind of like, eh, you know, you're not necessarily my favorite person. But we need to be able to all be unified in the church. We all need to be there as a brother and sister in Christ to help other people out. Even if they're not your favorite person, you need to be willing to just to, to be able to do that and not be bad mouthing and talking, backbiting and doing all this other nonsense within the church. Right. I mean, that's a cancer. That's a disease that really is going to hurt the church tremendously. That is why there's this protocol set forth. This is how you deal with things. Let's get it out in the open. Let's, let's establish the facts. Let's determine what's right. And when the church makes a decision, whether it's for you or against you, you have to go with it. If it's, for, if it's in your favor, it turns out that you were right and the other person was wrong. If that person accepts the judgment, which they ought to, the person who's wrong needs to accept that judgment. If they accept that judgment, then you need to be willing to say, okay, you know, he's humbled himself, he's, he's accepted it, I forgive you. We can move forward. And if they're not able to do it, though, then it says you can treat that man as a heathen and a publican. That's, that's no longer a requirement for then receiving the forgiveness. Uh, verse 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is, this is Jesus saying, you have this authority and this power. This is you know, what the church determines will stand as the judgment. This is, this is an authority that God has given to the church. Again, I say unto you, verse 19, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And this is in the context of, of this type of a judgment, right? So then Peter asks, you know, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? We say, well, how many times should I do this? Right? If I have this problem and I go to him and we get it settled, how many times can, that, can this just keep happening and happening? He says seven times. I mean... Seven times seems like a lot. And, that, and you notice seven times is the same exact number that Jesus has said in Luke 17, which is a little bit earlier. And Jesus is like, look, you know, I said seven times before. Basically, it's like, like I've said seven times, but don't use that as like, the num like this is the number, and it's after that, then you're okay not to forgive him. He says 70 times seven, right? Let's just, let's just, let's just come up with a really high number. Because that's not going to happen 490 times in one day. <laughs> so, so let's just put the number way up there because that's not the point of counting how many times a person does you wrong. Because think about it. If you're counting how many times someone does you wrong, are you really forgiving them? No. Not at all. If you're saying, you've done this to me eight times. Right. Did you forgive them the first time or not? To hold it over their head. So the teaching continues on, on forgiveness here. Look at verse number 23 here in Matthew 18. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. 
Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. And he gives a great story here of a person who has this huge debt and he can't pay it. And he's like, Lord, you know, just, just give me a little bit of time. Show me some leniency here and I'm going to pay you. I'm going to get it right with you. I'm, I'm trying hard. I want to do what's right. And that Lord says, you know what? I can see that, that you're trying, so I'm going to forgive you. But then that same person, someone owes him much less, a much smaller amount, a much smaller deal, comes to him in the same exact scenario. I can't pay, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do it. The same exact thing that he was just in. And he's like, no. I'm like, no, you're going to pay me. You owe this to me, you're going to pay me. And then what happens? Well, it comes back around and he's going to end up reaping what he's sown as a result of that type of an attitude. We need to ask ourselves, how would you like to be forgiven from God? Because this is going to be a, a guiding principle on how you forgive others. Sure. Turn back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. You're in Matthew 18, just go backwards to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, of course, we see the, the Lord's prayer there. And in verse 12, the, the Bible reads, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So the prayer to God here, the, the template that Jesus has given as a prayer, as an example prayer, is saying to God, forgive us our debts, forgive us what we owe, in the same way that we forgive people who owe things to us. That's what it means is as we forgive our debtors. The same way that we forgive them, Lord, forgive us. Keep that in mind when you're thinking about forgiving somebody. Because this is the way that God's going to deal with you as we saw in that previous parable that Jesus gave about, about the man that, that wouldn't forgive after he was forgiven. Verse 14, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now hopefully everyone here is humble enough to admit that you do wrong on a regular basis against God. Now think about those people in your life that you don't want to forgive, that have done you wrong. But they're repentant. Do you want God to not forgive you and to show mercy unto you for the wrong that you do on a daily basis because you're not willing to, to forgive somebody else that's done you wrong? You have to keep that at the forefront of your mind because that's the way that God is going to deal with us. You don't have to turn there, but Luke 6, uh, 37 reads, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The way that you deal with people is the way God's going to deal with you. The way that you forgive others is the way God's going to forgive you. Keep that in mind. And this is where we want to have a good attitude towards forgiving people. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be unconditional because we know that God is not going to provide unconditional forgiveness. It's not going to happen. But disputes that you have with another person ought to be handled within the church and the decision needs to be accepted. And um, there's also this teaching, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because there's, a, there's another guiding principle for us. You, you have kind of what's like, what I would consider to be like a law when it comes to forgiving people. And that is when someone is just completely repentant and then that is when we're supposed to be forgiving of them. But there's also a principle here. So if someone does you wrong, and especially in the smaller matters, the things that aren't like such a big deal, right. when someone offends you, right. when your brother offends you within the church, or it's some minor thing that happens, or maybe you lend them something and they break it, 
right? And you want them to replace it because they broke it and, and, and they don't have very much money and they're just like, well, I can't replace this. Or they just kind of think like they're trying to, to push the blame. Maybe they're just wrong and they're saying, well, I didn't do that. It was like that when I got it. You know, whatever. Whatever the case may be, these stupid little things that could come up and really start to drive a wedge between people and become a much bigger problem. The principle that we ought to have and we ought to be following, especially cases like this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, Now there, therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud in that your brethren. He said, instead of taking someone to court, you know, you, 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 you lend something to them and say, well, I'm going to sue you now because you owe me this money and I gave this to you and it was good when I gave it to you and now you owe me this money and I'm just going to sue you. He's saying, why would you, world, would you go through with that? Why don't you just allow yourself to suffer some wrong? Because God's going to see what happens and God is going to make what happened right in that situation. We could just trust God for that judgment anyways. That's right. It's way better when you have a, a brother in Christ to be able to just overlook what they've, they say, you know what, they've done wrong. You go to them and rebuke them, they still don't want to receive it. In certain instances, it's better just to say, you know what, I'm not even going to pursue this thing. I'm not even going to go after it. I'm not even going to try to get him to repent because I'm just going to allow this wrong to have happened and move forward because it's not even worth causing this, this, this escalation of events to happen. Amen. And we need to have that type of a spirit too to be able to say, you know what, even if they may not be repentant, it's not worth it. Now, I get it. Some things, you know, people can do you wrong and it can be a much more serious thing that happens, right? But not everything is like that. And, and especially when it comes to just some monetary things, is it really worth it to cause us, you know, all, all those extra type of problems to get everyone else involved? I think that the underlying spirit that we ought to have should say, no, in general, no, it's probably not worth it. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. When a judgment is made though in church and the punishment's meted out, or if it didn't even get to that point and the acknowledgement of wrongdoing is made, you need to receive that person back and forgive them. And if you don't, you are in sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians, we see the, uh, the, the man that was needed to be put out of the church who had his father's wife and, um, and you know, it was a wicked sin and there's all this stuff and, and there's you know, the, what needs to be done to him and needs to be delivered unto Satan and all this other stuff. But in, in the second epistle of the Corinthians, we see in chapter 2, Paul talking about someone here, it says in verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Okay, this guy suffered. Okay, he, he, he received his punishment. He received what was due unto him. It's sufficient. What has already happened, the punishment received is sufficient, verse 7, so that contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He's saying, you know what, when, they, when, they've, when the punishment has been paid, they're done. You can't hold that thing over their head against them. He says, unless they get this swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. It's like, what more, can, and this is kind of what happens in our, in our prison system today, in our, in our criminal system. Where it's like, people could commit a crime when they're younger, and it's like you could never outlive that. It follows you around for the rest of your life. It's something that you could just never receive forgiveness from. Anytime you go to work for someone, any, you know, it's just like, can I have just paid my time and be done? Can, can, can the justice have been served and it's just, we could forget about it and move forward now? And that's what's wicked about the justice system. But I mean, you could, we ought to have that definitely within the church. When, when, the, when, Things have been done and, and the wrongs have been righted. Don't hold that over the person's head. He says in verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Oftentimes it might be harder for you to do right when it comes to forgiving people. And he's saying, I want to confirm you. I want to see whether you're obedient in all things. When he's asking him just to, hey, look, receive this person back, forgive them, 
and, and show that you really are obedient in all the things that I'm commanding you. Verse 10, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Look at verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his, his devices. These problems lead to church splits, believe it or not. Right. They start with one thing between two, two individuals in a church. And they get out of control and people start taking sides. I'm on this person's side. I'm on that person's side. And it gets into this big thing and no one's willing to forgive and no one's willing to look over anything. And then, boom. Right. Now you have this huge division within a church that all started with something really small that probably should have just been overlooked to begin with. Right. Satan loves when that happens. Satan wants to get an advantage over you. We shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. We know that that's what he's trying to do. If you're holding grudges against people that have done you wrong or done your friends wrong after they've repented, then you are in sin. You are in the gall of bitterness. Remember, the title of the sermon was Forgiveness, Repentance, and Bitterness. Because ultimately, when you aren't able to forgive someone, you end up being bitter against them. That's right. And that bitterness is, is not something we're supposed to have. Turn, if you would, to, uh, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read Hebrews 12 for you for sake of time. We're getting a little bit long this morning, but we're almost done. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Many people being defiled. Many other people being affected as a result of your root of bitterness. It happens. And that's why in the preceding verses follow peace with all men. We're supposed to be looking to have peace within our church especially. I mean it says with all men but especially within our group here. We ought to be seeking peace. And in the, in the, the spirit of peace with one another, we ought to be able to receive wrong. And in the spirit of peace, we ought to be ready to forgive, right? And hopefully, we all ought to be ready to be humble and admit when we've done wrong also so we don't, we do, we don't end up being stiff-necked and causing the problems ourselves. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. To put away the bitterness when you're bitter towards people because of things that they've done. Put it away from you and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In the same way that God has forgiven you is the way that we ought to be forgiving towards other people. I mean, again, that's the, implying the, the repentance there, but still, it's a, you know, we need to be ready to do that and not hold grudges and be bitter towards people. Colossians chapter 3. Turn if you, turn if you would. It's the last place I have to turn. Colossians chapter 3. This is basically saying very, something very similar to Ephesians 4, but Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So first of all, this is where our mindset ought to be. And I've been bringing this up a lot lately that we need to be focused on the things of God, on the things of heaven, not on the things on this earth. But the things of this earth, that includes the stupid fights and strifes that you get involved with with people. Amen. We need to be focused on just serving the Lord and doing what's right by Him and not be so caught up and wrapped up in these, these dumb arguments that could come up and cause all this division. Look at verse number 12, continuing on here. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Look at all these attributes. You mean to tell me if you have all these attributes, you're really going to continue to have like a whole bunch of problems with people at church? Probably not. I mean, you shouldn't. And if something happens that egregious towards you, you got to bring it up to the church. But if you're having these type of attitudes, you shouldn't be having a bunch of strife and problem with people. That's right. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. 
If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And again, we see the same type of context. Like the same way that Christ has forgiven you. Because Christ, if you're honest with yourself, Christ has forgiven you of a lot. You need to be able to forgive them also. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We're called in one body. The body is important. God doesn't want there to be divisions within the church. The last point I'm going to make here regarding forgiveness, and I've already kind of touched on it, is being able to forget. Okay? It's an integral part of forgiveness. When you are able to forgive somebody, it means you can never bring that up again. The most common place is probably between spouses, between a husband and wife, right? Like, like you get over something... And then you have another fight later on. It's somewhat related to whatever problem you had before. And it's like, but you did this. You know, it's like, don't be bringing up old stuff. When you get past something, and this is good marriage advice, by the way. If you truly are going to forgive your spouse for something that they've done wrong to you, which you ought to anyways. I mean, if you want to last together in marriage, you really need to have that spirit of, of forgiveness to be able to, to, to allow for the, the wrongs that your spouse does to you. Because if you're holding grudge and bitterness, you're going to split up. But if you can't do the forgiveness, like that, that's what's going to happen. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drive a wedge between you. But I don't care if you've been done wrong to. Once you get past that and you've forgiven your spouse, your wife, your husband, don't ever bring that up to them again. Don't be rehashing the past. If you're, especially, oh, you're, I'm sorry, I've done wrong. What in the world are you doing bringing that up to them again? They've admitted their fault. Don't keep throwing it in their face. I mean, that goes completely against everything that Scripture teaches. Right. Completely against it. And that's wickedness. Because think about that on the receiving end. If you've already humbled yourself, you've acknowledged your sin, and you're sorry for what you've done, what more can you do? I mean, you can't make up for something you've done, and then you just have to hear this over and over and over and over again. It's like, I thought you forgave me already. I thought you said I accept your apology. I thought, you know, I thought this was behind us. Right. And it ought to be. And if you're not willing to forgive it, then you have a problem with your bitterness and unable to actually forgive. That just proves that you didn't actually forgive. Right. Because part of forgiveness is forgetting about it, putting those things behind you. Jeremiah 31, 33 reads, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, listen to this, and I will remember their sin no more. That's the forgiveness that God shows us. He said, I'm going to forgive their iniquity and I'm not even going to remember their sin anymore. It's gone. It's out of his memory. He's not thinking about it anymore. He's not just, just still going to keep rehashing it and bring it up. Now, the last uh, scripture I'm going to just bring up because this is more of an exception than the rule. We've seen over and over throughout the Bible the, pretty much the rule that we ought to follow. But Jesus actually gave a good example of forgiveness of people that did not repent, right then at least, but they were simply ignorant when he was up on the cross. When he was nailed to that cross, Luke 23, 34 reads, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Here is an example of a forgiveness. And this, is, this might be the only example that you could find where it is not based on the repentance. We could even see in the Old Testament, you know, we are responsible for the sins that we do through ignorance. But here we see Jesus in his last moments on earth showing a forgiveness towards people just because he says, you know what, they don't even realize what they're doing. They don't know who I am. They think they're just doing their job or whatever, right? Right? And, and he asks for forgiveness on those people. They don't even know what they're doing. It's a good forgiveness to keep in mind. 
that, that he did do that. As we, you know, and, and again, this seems to be more of the exception to the general rule that we found just laid out in Scripture after passage after passage after passage after passage after passage. But it's an important one. Jesus is the best example that we have to follow, and that's, and that's something we need to remember. Now, again, you can look at the circumstances and say that's not just still unconditional forgiveness for everything, no matter what. It was this one. It was just the fact that they didn't, they didn't know what he was doing. And that's why the Apostle uh, Paul was able to receive his forgiveness. He says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, the things that he did. I didn't know. And, and he repented. He got right. He, he got saved. And, and you know, he received forgiveness also. But um, let's, forgiveness is extremely important. As much as you value the forgiveness that you've received, we ought to hold that same high value on forgiveness for other people. Let's not get wrapped up into this weird mindset of just knee-jerk forgiveness, no matter what anyone's ever done. If it's the worst thing in the world, like, like yeah, I forgive Hitler, like all this stuff, whatever. Just, just all these people, you know, the pedophile that comes in and, and molests my children, I'm just going to forgive him. You know, like, that's ridiculous. But most situations are not that. Right? right? right. Most situations are going to be dealt with on some much, much, much smaller scale. And on those things, you know what? We ought to be ready to forgive. You ought to have a spirit of humbleness and meekness and not thinking so highly of yourself to be able to say, you know what? I forgive you. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the forgiveness that you've shown unto us. God, we thank you that, that you really have a lot of mercy, dear Lord. We know that it's not just unconditional, but... Uh, we pray that you would please help us to understand how we ought to forgive others and that we ought to realize that, that it is something that we need to be doing um, when people do us wrong and then, and then they, uh, they realize they are their ways. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us all when we do wrong to others that we would know that we have done wrong. Uh, too often times we have people that, both people think that they're right. Both people think that they're in the right, dear Lord. And when it comes to these types of situations, especially the smaller deals, I pray that you would please help us to be able to just show some humility and for the sake of maybe for the church or whatever, to be able to say, I'm just going to allow this wrongdoing to be done and I'm going to forgive that person, dear Lord. But if people get in that situation, God, I pray that you please also uh, lead them to, to bring it before the church, to bring it before other people, to, you know, to try to deal with it one-on-one, -on -one but follow the steps prescribed so that it doesn't become this major problem within our church here, within our body, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to, to, to have the wisdom, to follow the appropriate steps, dear God, and also just to have the humility of mind to not blow up things to, into greater issues than they really are, Lord. Please bless this church and help us to be unified in our faith and our love to one another and our love towards you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.